Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this very special bonus episode with a guest we've had in the recent past, Dan Vacanti. Hi, Dan. Welcome back. Vasco, thanks so much for having me back so quickly. I mean, this is um, this, this is a highlight of my month. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a pleasure. We talked about data last time, and, and we kind of teased that we would be talking a lot more about data in, in a future episode, which is today's episode. We, we will be talking about the psychology of communicating data. But first, a little bit about Dan. Dan is a 20 plus years software industry veteran who spent most of the last years focusing on lean and agile practices. In 2007, he helped to develop the Kanban method for knowledge work. And he also co-founded Actionable Agile, which provides industry leading predictive analytics, uh, analytic tools, sorry, and services to any uh, lean and agile process company. Dan also co-founded the ProKanban.org, a community-focused community focused initiative, sorry, to help people learn more about Kanban. Of course, that is an important piece of background because in the Kanban community, you guys have been pioneering the use of data a lot in the within the Agile Brother community. So that's that's also important for today's episode. We're probably going to talk about Kanban as well. And we're probably also going to talk about no estimates, which was the topic our, of our last episode. And you can listen to that episode. The link is in the show notes. This episode, however, we are talking about the psychology of using and communicating data, a key feature, of course, of all estimation and no estimation related processes. So let's start with context first, though, Dan. What is uh, What are, uh, in your mind, the challenges that we must be aware of when we use and communicate data, not only about estimates, but data in general? I'll shy away from the, the estimate side of things. I'll, I'll let you maybe a, a address that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll talk more to the actual, actual real data that we're collecting. Like, like, like so many of the questions that, that you asked, Vasco, there, I think there are several answers and several layers to, to it. One of the biggest pitfalls to start out when you're communicating using data is assuming that people understand the data that you're presenting them. Most people have, if they've been trained at all, most people have been trained inc- incorrectly, in my humble opinion anyway to assess and analyze data. That's kind of kind of the first things, you know, they're going to do things like, you know, dis- distill it down into easily consumable chunks and, and start talking about things like- Or a like single aver- number very often. A single number, yeah. I'll start talking about things like averages and, and stuff like that. So, and when we talk about forecasting, average is kind of killer. Um, so so to me, that, that's number one, but probably even more important that even if they do understand what they're looking at, the biggest pitfall for me by far when presenting data to people is assuming that they will respond rationally when presented with that data. And I, th- I think that kind of gets to the crux of what, what we're going to be, be talking about today is um, most people think, oh, yeah, you know, we've got this data in black and white, and here it is. It's hard fact. It's truth. And people will respond rationally. And for the most part, they don't. People don't don't respond rationally. In fact, I had a you know conversation with uh, a friend, a friend of mine, Todd Miller, and we were talking about how a lot of times people behave more irrationally when presented with with actual evidence. So let's dive into that a little bit, though, because I I think I know what you mean, but I of course want to double check when you say people don't react rationally. Now, a friend of mine uh, would say that uh, whenever a person reacts, there's many systems at play, right? Like there's the emotional part, obviously, we all recognize that. And there's quite a lot of research and investigation on the fact that emotions are inseparable of how we act on anything. And there's also the perspective side, right? Like I have one perspective on a number, you have another perspective on a, on a number. There's that old adage of the glass half full. Well, for somebody else, it's it's half empty, right? So what, what do you actually mean precisely, Dan, when you say that people react irrationally when presented with data. You know, you can you can have a conversation about appropriate interventions based on what the data is telling us. You know, you know, there's the classic project management stuff like, you know, cut scope or, you know, add people or, you know, change change to the date. But more often, which I, you know, I would I would argue I, I would maybe pitch those more as kind of kind of the rational, but more often it's like, 
let's do a death march. Let's cancel overtime. Let's let's cancel holidays. Let's you know you know um, you know. Or, let's just try harder. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Um, or or you know the, the 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 numbers are wrong. I don't believe the numbers, and so you know I'm going to kind of do you know do do my own thing. So. I don't know. Maybe I'm going. Uh, I'm going on a limb here and saying that maybe a feature of an irrational reaction to data is the reaction that is built on the assumption that we know what it means. Meaning that if I say, "Hey, the project is late," very likely this happened to me. Right? I'm talking to a program manager. We're six months into a twelve-month project, and I say, "Hey, we're going to be six months late, at least, probably more." And uh, a rational type of reaction in my mind would be, oh, interesting. What data did you collect and why did you come to that conclusion? That would be a rational reaction, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. trying to analyze, is this data credible? Where is it coming from? How, how did you interpret it? And so on. An irrational reaction could be either you're crazy, that's not possible, or even you're absolutely right, let's panic immediately, right? So what I mean by this is, Maybe one way to describe a rational reaction to data might be that instead of taking an action, like reacting immediately, we first try to analyze what the data means, where is it coming from, is there counter data, like is data pointing, all data pointing in the same direction, or are there other data pointing in another direction, and, and specifically in project management, this is very important, because you never know the future, you only have the data you have in front of you, right? How do you see it? What would be a rational reaction to data? We have to be a, a little bit careful. I mean, I certainly take your point, but most of my my efforts for the past several years have been focused on. Well, let me take a step back because you you, you make a you know a really good point. I think that most people need to understand is in any data set there is going to be both noise and there's going to be signal, right? And you know, I think kind of what you're what you're getting at is trying to understand, you know, what what is that signal? Can we separate the signal from the noise? What is that signal and what is that that signal telling us? Because if if, if we're responding to noise, we're going to make things worse. If we don't respond to signal, we're going to make things worse. To me, that that's you know that's that's kind of key. The reason I say that is because most of my efforts for the past several years have been trying to understand how do we get that signal as early as possible? Because it's not so much that I want that signal early so we can panic. It's I want that signal early so that we can take appropriate action so that any action that we do take can have some impact. And so, and so that's why, yes, you know, I think it's reasonable that, you know, we can collect some data and we need to take a step back and say, understand, okay, do we really understand what it's telling us? Do we have the full picture? I'm hoping, um, and I, you know, there's 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 one metric that I think I can point people to, that kind of gets us down this path. But but I'm hoping that there there's data that we can look at that's like, you know what, this this really is signaling something, and intervention is warranted immediately, if not if not very soon. So I don't know if that addresses what what you were talking about, but I, I want to make sure. Yes, yes, cool heads. Hopefully, cool heads prevail. But if we do get a clear, unambiguous signal, that that should be impetus to act and and probably act quickly. And, and I think that's a, a very important caveat, right? If we have a clear signal, there's a psychological dynamic that I'd like to get uh, your take on. So this is something that I'm sure all of our listeners have seen happening in front of them. I've so, I've observed that uh, very often in, in multi-team environments, there's an implicit incentive to hide data, to hide information, to hide the signal. And and we know that, and Agile tried to get rid of it by saying that only running software is, is a, a demonstration of progress, right? Or, or evidence of progress. Very often in projects, it's, it's actually a PowerPoint saying that everything is green until it's not, right? So there's this implicit incentive to hide information about the project or, or the delivery being late. And this leads to this too late to do anything phenomenon, right? Whereby the first team that communicates that they are late is blamed. So everybody hides that until it's too late to do anything and say, and then of course, when the first team says, yeah, oh, sorry, uh, by the way, we're not going to be able to deliver. The panic is level is so high that we focus on, you know, making people work overtime and so on. And all the other teams are excused, even though they were also late, but you know, nobody's uh, focusing on that. H have you observed that kind of dynamic? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, of, of course. And and, we, and you know me, I have, I have thoughts, I have an opinion on everything. So, but as before, there, I think there, there are several dimensions at, at play here. So yes, yes, absolutely have seen that. First, I, you know, I, I think there's an element of shame 
people don't want to look, look bad. I mean, every, getting back to the psychology of these things, everybody wants to be the hero of their own story. And the last thing they want to do is tell a story where they it paints a light that they failed. So I, th- I think there's an element of shame. There's also an element of fear that you brought up because anybody who puts their head above the parapet, that's, you know, that's what's going to get blown off. Nobody wants to take that blame and nobody wants to get have any repercussions for communicating late. But I think a big, big dimension of it that maybe doesn't get talked about as much, at least, you know, maybe not not that I've heard, again, gets back to this psychology and rationality of things is I think a lot of times people think, well, I know that the data tells us we're going to be late, but but we can still get it done. You know, there's this this element of hope. There's this element of optimism. Optimism, yeah. And and we can pull together and and everything's going to be okay. People are these eternal optimists. And again, to me, that's it sounds harsh, but I think that that's an irrational strategy. What do you think about any of those? Yeah, absolutely. So de- definitely shame is there. And obviously, there's the fear of the condemnation that comes with that. And also, the element of optimism is actually rather strong. I mean, what, one of the first things that I learned about estimation, and I am going to bring it up because, of course, it's one of the few areas where we have concrete, hard data to look at, even though we try to avoid it very hard in, in the software field. When we look at the estimates, people even faced with data, they will come up with narratives. And this is the key word here, narratives. We're talking about psychology, right? So they come up with narratives whereby the past was slower than the future. We will always be faster in the future. Of course, this is optimism. Of course, this is kind of uh, trying to hide things that might be problems, but they are not talking about them. And obviously, it's also an element of ignoring the data. And one of the things that I've tried to put forward with the work that I've done in No Estimates is that the world could be worse than what the data tells you. And it's better for you to be prepared for that than, uh, and then the world being better than what the data tells you, right? Like a positive surprise, then you're not being prepared and then you having a negative surprise, right? So uh, we also need to bring into the conversation and, and maybe we could talk about that a little bit further and your experience on it. We need to bring to the conversation the aspects related to risk management, right? So talking about risk and the consequences versus the actions that we can take. I I was just about to interrupt you and say, hey, we need to talk about risk management. This is something I think we we spent a a bit of time on in the last episode. That's kind of the, the, the next key thing, I think. So before I talked about how all data has noise, some data has signals, that's kind of the first, the first thing. The next thing from that, if if you believe that, then kind of, to me, the next step along there is uh, if we can separate the signal from the noise, what's the probability, you know, of, you know, certain events happening? What are appropriate mitigations? What are appropriate risk reduction strategies? What are appropriate, what, you know, whatever based on that? Because the, the data is never going to be clear, you know, 100%, this is what's going to happen or 0%, this is what's going to happen. That's The data will never come out that way. We do not live in a deterministic world, which means we have to start taking a probabilistic approach, which kind of brings us full circle to what I was saying about before is when you start presenting probabilities to people, you know, their eyes kind of glaze over because most people don't understand probabilistic thinking. I I say this all the time too. I'm not even sure that I understand probabilistic thinking. I like this topic and I wanted to uh, go a little bit deeper and explore some examples of things that probabilities tell you and things that probabilities don't tell you. So you've already said one, right? Like knowing the probability of an event does not tell you whether the event will happen. Exactly. Right. And and there's another problem, a problem that I've, I've seen very often, even from the probability friendly crowd which is this illusion that knowing the probability of a delivery date means it will happen meaning that you know there's a 90 cent pro- 90% probability of delivering before december 25th the christmas problem as we usually talk about well that doesn't mean that you're likely going to deliver before december 25th it means that if you did 100 projects 95 of those would be delivered before the 25th of december so this concept of probability is not applying to single events and therefore the the kinds of probabilities that we talk about are actually not useful for decision making right not, not all like there are probabilities that are useful for decision making but the probability of a release date is not one of them i think we'd have to talk about the, about that a little bit more 
certainly the idea understanding probability doesn't necessarily mean an event will or will not happen. You know, my my favorite example of this, I don't know if it's everybody else's favorite example of this, is the uh, is the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Going into that, everybody had Trump at about a 25 percent chance of of winning. Yet we all know what what happened in you know in in that election, and the immediate reaction to that was, oh well, the pundits got it wrong, the statisticians got it wrong, everybody got it wrong. You know that you know how could Trump get elected when he only had a 25 percent? And the thing is. 20% is not zero, you know? I mean, it's it's that, that he, every, to your point, every four elections, Trump's going to win one of those, you know? Um, yeah, if his if his chances are twenty five percent, exactly, and 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 this is why, for example, one of the the things that you work on, which I think is is important for us to highlight, is using data to provide Monte Carlo simulation for project decision making. And uh, one of the things that is very important is that that data needs to be related to multiple events during the project. It cannot be related only to one single event. Like one way that that I describe this when I'm asked this it's perfectly okay to forecast the delivery date of many stories over time and through that create a a Monte Carlo simulation of when the project might be delivered. But it's the stories that you're simulating, not the project, because the project only happens once, right? And just like the election, 25% means, you know, every four elections he's going to be elected. It doesn't mean that he's not likely to be elected. Correct. I mean, the, the, this potentially gets, gets us a little bit off topic, so we, we can cut it. But the, the question I'd want to ask, and then maybe we come back to what we're talking about, is when we do get that outcome that wasn't what we were expecting, for example, you know, Trump Trump winning the 2016 election. And, and again, I think, I think you were hinting to this. The, the question we need to ask is, no, number one, did we just get unlucky, you know, or, or lucky, depending on what your political persuasion is, right? <laughs> you, know, did, you know, did we get unlucky or did we get lucky? But to me, a more important question to ask is, was our was our model right or wrong? You know, it's it's possible we got the wrong answer with the right model or the right answer with, you know, with, with the wrong model. Separating out those two things, I think, is, you know, is, is really, really hard. Um, and to your point, especially with long running projects where you only get that one outcome. Going back and doing that analysis, well, okay, what was it? Was it was it was it how we forecasted that was wrong? Did we just get unlucky? You know what what you know what what happened? I don't, I don't have a good answer to that, to be honest with you. I think we need to bring that back to that idea that okay, we are dealing with people, right? We're talking about social dynamics, right? So one problem we have with data is the uh, Heisenberg principle of decision making, right? The, the moment you start measuring, you've already affected the kind of decisions that are possible, right? So we we don't know what generates what, but we know that there's a social dynamic happening. You know, we talked about shame and optimism and, and so on that comes with it, and. What I'm thinking, and this is what I've been trying to kind of put forward in the work that I've done also on no estimates, is that data should be there to enable decision making. And of course, then we need to have the heuristics that we put on top of that data, right? Like a a, a very common example that I use is a football player, so a European football player, trying to hit the ball with his left foot, let's say he's left footed, while the ball is in the air coming towards him and he's running forward to get into a position where he can score. Like there's so many things that could be different than what the player expects. So they don't do physics calculations, right? They don't do, you know, the the uh, um, uh, projectile equations on their head. They're looking at the ball and they're running at the same time. And here's the key. The players that succeed at that kind of trick they are very often, most of the time, looking at the ball, not necessarily at the terrain or the position. They already have the terrain and the position in their minds, and they're looking at the ball in order to be able to use the eye coordination heuristic, right? You're always looking at the target, you move towards the right place, and then you execute the kick. If a defender comes in and interferes that, the attacker is likely to miss the shot because now the attacker needs to take another variable into account and and therefore lost sight of the goal. And when I bring that back to project management, and this is what I use in no estimates, is the goal is to release on a certain date. You know, deadlines exist, whether because you run out of money or Christmas is coming, whatever there is, or or even there's no patience to go later than that, whatever the reason is, there's a deadline for almost everything. So if we keep the eye on the deadline and we constantly manage scope using good agile practices like continuous delivery and deployment, et cetera, et cetera, if we keep the eye on the ball and continuously move forward and manage scope towards that, we have a chance of delivering on time, right? And and this for me 
brings back the importance of understanding what data is there to do for us, right? Data is there to kind of put a little bit of structure into a heuristic that we already have in place. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of people like to talk about data-driven decisions and things like that. I, I kind of more like to what you're saying. I kind of more like the, the phrase data-informed because at the end of the day, it is humans making making decisions. And context, people say context is king. I like to say context is queen. The, the data have, have no meaning, you know, apart from their context. And it, the data won't tell you the context. It's up for the human's interpretation of that of that context and what does that, that data mean in, in, in that context, to be sure. So, I guess I'm in violent agreement with you. I don't know that I really have. So, so uh, may, maybe one way to phrase this, and let me know if you agree, is that when we use data, we need to recognize that data is context agnostic. The context is always brought in w- by the people who are looking at the data. Correct, correct. And this is that synthesis that you're talking about there is where it really becomes more art than science. People think data collection and analysis is is a hard science, and it's not because... You know, understanding the anal- the uh, the context under which that data was collected is huge, and it's it, there's always going to be a bias. There's always going to be a something from from the person who is who is analyzing the the data, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it, it, but we just need to recognize that we can't just throw data up on a chart somewhere and expect us to tell us everything that we need to know. That's really not how it works. So I, I think that from a point of view of the Scrum Masters, we also need to help our friends out there, maybe struggling to communicate a message using data to, to their peers and their managers and their stakeholders. What are some of the advice that you can share that you've learned over the years that can be useful to take into account when communicating data? Now, I, I'm not advocating here that we should use data for a particular outcome because, of course, that, that's also a possibility. I mean, we are talking about our own opinions as well, but but rather to communicate data to help decision makers, right? Like, so I'm, I'm assuming we're, as Scrum Masters, we're not actually making the decisions. We're creating, maybe even helping to collect data to help create the necessary information that decision makers need in order to make a decision. So from that perspective, what are some of the advice that you need to, that you would like to share? The hardest lesson I learned, um, and I learned it learned it very, very early on, but I still haven't, I don't know that I've still done a, done a good job of, of figuring it out, is people are always going to run to some, some type of tool, whether it's story points, you know, whether it's cycle time, whether it's Monte Carlo simulation, whatever it is, are always going to want to run, want to, run to, to some type of tool when presenting data. And for me, presentation of data is, has never been a tooling problem. It's always been an education problem. That's, that's where I, I would start. I mean, there has to be some type of education. I would seem strange, especially if you're talking to you know upper management or executives or whatever. But there there has to be some type of some type of education, you know, of this stuff. Because yeah, I can go collect a, a lot of flow metrics and I can present pretty charts with you know cycle time and throughput and I can I can show a Monte Carlo analysis and I can do all, all this stuff. But if they don't know what they're looking at, it's it's you know it's 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 going to be meaningless. And then now now all this other stuff, the psychology of it, you know, kind of kind of really jumps in that we've talked about before. So where where should we go if we want to learn more about how to help others be more, uh, I would say, deliberate about how they look at and use data in their decision making. I can share some of some of my favorite authors on this. You know where where, where I've gone. I don't know, I don't know if that's that, that's what you necessarily mean, but okay. <laughs> but I, but I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. You know I don't know that people should necessarily follow what I do. Now of course of course people can follow you, and we'll give everybody the links to find you on on social media and your website and so on uh, to get a distilled version of it. But there are some geeks here in the audience, so let's go for it. For me, the the person who really brought rigor to to this concept that we, we we've been talking about this uh, is a guy by the name of Walter Schuert. I don't know if anybody knows who, who Schuert is. If you don't know who Schuert is, you you should because Schuert was Deming's mentor. You know, everybody everybody in Lean talks about Deming, 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 and they should because Deming was was brilliant. But Schuert taught Deming everything that Deming knows about data, and so I I, I went back to the uh, you know I, I go back and I read the original Schuert. His writing is not as accessible as Deming. I think that's why, why Deming is, is so popular. And I would read Deming. I'd read a lot on Deming. Contemporary authors on this topic would be a guy by the name of Dr. Donald Wheeler as well, W-H-E-E-L-E-R. Um, 
But then there, there are people like like Don Reinenson, who, as as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, in, in in current times, you know, his his thinking on on this topic is is a second to none. So yeah, um, and and I think that the reference to Donald uh, uh, is very important here. Don Reinertsen, uh, I mean, especially because he brought a model with him that helps to clarify some of the signal out of all the data that we might be collecting, right? Like, so the the whole concept of the cost of delay is is a very good, I would say, uh, complicated concept, but it's a concept that brings a model with it that helps us to distill some of the implications that the data have. This is especially useful, of course, for companies that develop software uh, as their main occupation, as well as continuously develop software. If you do one-off projects only, there's still a lot to learn, but uh, maybe other parts, not, not necessarily the cost of delay. But definitely one of the things that I would like to highlight here is that the authors that you mentioned, uh, some of them are, are more or less accessible. For me, Don Don's book, the original book, I think from the 90s, I, I, I forget the name right now, was much more easy to read than the second generation flow, uh, which is a collection of principles, more like a, a, a textbook, if you will to be used in a, in a, in a university course. So uh, I'll put the link on the show notes so that people can easily, easily find it as well. And one of the things that we talked about, like the, the psychology of using data is not easy, but it can also work in our favor. So one of the things we talked about already was risk management. And what I learned in my own experience is that if you use data in order to justify the existence of a risk rather than to push a solution or a decision, you're more likely to get a sympathetic ear because everybody wants to solve risks, but not everybody thinks they should be solved the same way you do, right? Yes, <laughs> I, don't know. I, you want me to, I don't know if you want me to add, add, add something to that. Um, I kind of want to add on to that. I mean, like I said, I don't have anything necessarily to add directly to that because I totally agree. But one, one heuristic, if you will, that I like to follow, follow when, it, when we're talking about um, handling risk or, or ways to handle the risk is, so many times I see in uh, you know in agile projects specifically that people want to take on long term risk for short term gain, and for me it, it's it should be the complete opposite. We should be taking on short term risk for long term gain. That was the whole point of Scrum. Is the, the way that I read Scrum that that was that as a reaction to Waterfall. Waterfall was taking on you know all, you know all, all kinds of risk all over the place, and Scrum comes along and says, you know what, we should probably limit our risk to less than a month and probably much less than that and let's only let's 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 try and contain our risk for the next couple of weeks and see see what happens you know hopefully that will buy us you know much better gains you know in, in the long term and it, it surprises me it seems like most agilists out there kind of kind of get that backward because they think it's it's more about but let, let's cut corners in order to you know get this get this release out let's start too much work in progress you know from a kanban from a flow perspective let's start too much work in progress because of course the sooner we start something the sooner we'll we'll finish something you know and they're they're, they're taking on all this risk and they don't even know it and it's a bunch of long-term risk to try and get those short-term gains yeah, I think that's a great heuristic, something that I, I'm sure will help many of our friends out there. It's better to take short-term risk, typically small risk, like one iteration, because long-term risk is usually big risk, like a big bang release or a rewriting of a platform. I mean, don't just get me started on the rewriting anti-pattern in software. That would be a whole uh, another episode, so let, let's skip that. But I think kind of in, in summary, in my mind, we talked about the psychology of using data, but we, we referred to and we just ended up again talking about the fact that a lot of what the, the job that data needs to perform is to inform risk assessment and therefore also decisions related to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's job number one and job number all of it you, you know um, i don't that's 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 really what don't you, you can't look at data like i said you can't necessarily look at data and and um assume the data is going to tell you what what to do or or what not to do that's you know unfortunately not not how it works and the sooner that we, we can get to a point where we're embracing that uncertainty rather than rejecting that uncertainty, but embracing that uncertainty, uh, it opens up all kinds of you know, different avenues for us in terms of how we might go about you know, managing our, our projects, our products, 
Yeah, that that's a very good point as well, embracing uncertainty. Dan, it's been a pleasure. I mean, this was just the start of the conversation. I, I feel we could be on, you know, we, we could have this talk over dinner, uh, a few glasses of good wine, and, and uh, I think we wouldn't run out of topics to converse. It's been a pleasure. So before you go, tell us, where can we find out more about you and the work that you're doing? If anybody wants to go to the, the ProKanban.org website, it's just pro, literally ProKanban, P-R-O, ProKanban.org. You know, go to the website and you can see what we're doing there. Uh, I got a couple of books published. Uh, if you want to check me out on, on LeanPub or, or Amazon, you know, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn sporadically, but I'm usually just complaining about tennis, although Nadal has been having a great year this year. So um, not much to complain about there. But yeah, I mean, re, 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 oh, and uh, Drunk Agile Project podcast, which I think we talked about last time that we would love to have you on, Basco, if, if, if you're up for it sometime soon. Check us out, uh, Drunk Agile, on YouTube. would love to see all of you there, and you specifically, Basco. Absolutely. So the challenge is accepted. So whenever you're ready, I'll be ready. Once again, Dan, thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. No, thank you for the invitation. Um, I enjoy this. I hope we get to do it again very, very soon. These are, these are conversations I always look forward to, so can't wait to do it again. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.